Hi, and welcome to today's episode of The Focus. I'm Aldu. And I'm Horia. And today we have the distinct pleasure of uh, welcoming Joanne Stone. We met at Agile 2022 in Nashville, and I was really impressed by her perspective. So Joanne, welcome. Uh, tell us a bit about your life story, your river of life. My river of life. I really love that question. <laughs> how far back do you want me to go? Oh, well, <laughs> and how much time? Do <laughs> go for it. There's plenty of time. <laughs> um, you know, I think maybe there's there's things I start to think about when you ask for that. It's the, the main things which really shape who I am today. Right. And um, uh, my um, history is I am a um, I'm part of a family of six, six kids. Um, and my mother had two sets of twins. Um, and, uh, so it was a single, a twin, a single and a twin. <laughs> um, and, um, basically the twins we have, we have identical twins and non-identical twins. So my mother had just everything all at the same time, but I was a middle child. So I'm the, the type of person who's always played that specific role of, uh, being, you know, the neutral party, the Switzerland, the one that's trying to hold everyone together and um that sort of kind of progressed uh, in the rest of my my life as well where i just was that played that kind of like middle person that you know defended everybody took care of everyone and made sure that there is somewhat of a harmony that was happening um so yeah so uh i mean i have um and for schooling perspective i mean i, I originally i wanted to be a marine biologist but then i got scared of waters where i couldn't see anything <laughs> underneath and <laughs> and like in ontario and stuff like that right like it's just like there's not like clear water like we're in the, the caribbean and then um so it can get pretty murky kind of lakes and so it's not so pretty to kind of train in the areas up here. So I actually ended up um, going into computer science. So um, I have a, a computer science and a, a math um, math major. So very science, science uh, background and um, finished off school and became a developer. So I started off my career as a uh, developer who I have to sit there and say, I always also love solving problems. So my thing was always like, ooh, get into a problem to kind of uh, something juicy to kind of get into. And I was doing compilers and stuff like that. And man, those are really difficult to do. <laughs> 40, I think 40% of the class actually failed. I was like, I was one of the lucky ones, but I had, I was really greatly supported by some really great friends who kind of like helped me with that. Um, but, um, and I progressed like through my uh, career, my journey, working as a developer and kept on going through. And I think you're, Corey, you're, you're like, you listen to some of the podcasts, you have a program manager, like a background too um so yeah i was like you know senior program manager as I'm, i was also a manager um uh, a senior systems analyst so i did a bunch of things but i have a techie 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 background um and amongst all of me going through and uh um and i can never sit still too long i was always going for new roles new new projects new everything had to be new 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 um i had four lovely girls so i'm a, i'm a mother of four beautiful girls which i'm very super super proud of um but uh, uh through this river of life uh, it has had its ups and downs i've had um, plenty of issues as well with uh, passing my father when i was really quite young um i've had a divorce um about three years ago um uh, but have done really quite well i'm really quite happy about that um i uh, went on to the agile journey and uh got out there and was an agile coach and got fired from the first uh, the first job that i had as an agile coach that was so much fun let me tell you <laughs> But I really, you know, that was a great learning exercise for me because it was one of those things where I had, um, you know, at that particular point in time, uh, new leaders were actually brought in and um, their definition of what an agile coach was and my definition of an agile coach was different, right? So, um, and so it totally made sense for some of that stuff to happen. Um, so, but I was at a very large company. So the, I was at a telecom company in Canada. I worked there for a good amount of years, probably just around 20 years. 
Um, and in that particular company, I played Switzerland a lot. I worked between the business and IT, and I was that middle, middle, middle man or middle woman um, that was doing a lot of the work. Um, but what I saw over the years was this, how slow it took to actually implement how much more cost it, it took to mm. to actually uh, put any changes into place right like that one thing that used to take two or three months to do was now taking six months and cost 10 times more right there was more bureaucracy there was more you know there's there's a lot of there was a lot more processes that we had to go through it was just it was just it was horrible right they were going through and i was seeing it was just it was it was disheartening for me to kind of see this company that I love so much just um, just struggle struggle with communicating struggle with talking struggle 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 so I, I had a point where I, I went through I had three doors I would say I would go through either I had the door of I would leave the company the first door was leave the company second door was okay I can still continue on doing what I was doing and or the third was actually trying to make a difference and I chose the door number three which I was really grateful for uh, and this is where agile kind of came into my particular space so um, so from an agile perspective, I started, to, I brought, I, I was working within the community and I'm sure you guys have, you guys know great communities, which are around the world from agile. I'm sure you've experienced it yourself. Yes. <laughs> and so I felt like I was brought up by the community mm -hmm. and, uh, they took me in and they kind of like, okay, Joanne, let's help you do this and help you do this transformation that, uh, the company was working on. And so what happened is we actually got up like uh, 90 teams up and running in 18 months. And so it was really a huge feat. And this was back in 2014 um, or so. So um, so I got hooked. I got hooked really bad <laughs> on this on this agile thing. Right. I'm going, oh, my gosh, this is great. It's like, you know, we get to listen to each other. Oh, my middle child was like, yeah, it was great. Yeah. Oh, we get to problem solve. Problem solve. I'm going, oh, yeah. It's, you know, this is really cool. Let's get our hands in there. Right. Um, I get to work with people. Wonderful. You know, so um, and um, so, yeah, so I basically it was it was such a such a real real treat to kind of be able to do that. And then I found this person. Her name was Lisa Atkins. Mm. Um, <laughs> someone told me, go talk to Lisa Atkins. She knows how to do this in the corporation. And this was back in 2014. I fell in love with her and I followed her <laughs> and I kept on following her. I, you know, she must have thought it was really <laughs> like um I would maybe 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 followed her a little bit too much um but you know I learned so much from her and um she was really helpful for me and and I and I think uh, a lot of like her coaching book and um our coaching mm -hmm. agile teams um and then I just fell in love with the the professional coaching world so I, I went into professional coaching um, and, uh, and then I'm also a person that sees gaps. So like, I, I see gaps and things and I want to build bridges across things. So I noticed within the community, um, that we had all these new agilists that were getting fully certified. Like there's this huge, you know, demand. I need a scrum master. I need a scrum master. I need an agile coach. And there's hardly any, so everyone was getting certifications. So, um, but the thing is they didn't have a community to talk to. There was, they're, they're fully new. So I, I actually end up, um, you know, creating a uh, coaching program in Toronto. We've uh, a mentoring program in Toronto. We've mentored over 500 people. And so that was pretty exciting, um, which then has led me down this pathway of actually um, uh, getting into uh, and being the founder of Wicked Agility. So um Geez, I don't know. Is that what you wanted to know from my river of life? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that was astonishing. So, yeah. yeah. I'm really, and so I have to tell you, I'm really happy right now. So like, I just, you know, it's, it's, I'm very exciting. I'm very excited. I, I'm doing what I love. And I, I tell a lot of people that I, I feel like I've retired, right? I, mm. I feel like this, this is just loving what you're doing you're doing what i'm love you're loving right and um so and that's where i think that we can create the bigger impact right is by um by doing something that you um really 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 feels it matters to you right um mm -hmm. some people would say passionate for right and um yeah so i'm really really in a great place right now so i'm very grateful i am grateful to be here and and meeting you Haria like at the agile 22 conference that was really cool yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, because uh in our first episode we talk about ikigai which is exactly what you've described this mm. feeling of 
I'm so enjoying the life. I'm so in service to others. I'm so determined to get good at this, right? And yeah. oh, actually the world needs it. It's not just a <laughs> sinecure or something. It's not a hobby. <laughs> Yeah. It's true. Yeah. It's true. It's true. The world does need 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 people like us, right? So we oh, really yeah. do. Oh, so yeah. If we're not going to do it, someone else is going to do it, guys. So, um, <laughs> but it, it's uh, yeah, we have the ability to do it. So we're well, gonna do see, it. that's <laughs> the thing. It's not guaranteed that somebody else is going to do it. So that's well, why that's it's on us. <laughs> yeah, I can't guarantee that. <laughs> <laughs> someone's got it here right so okay <laughs> all right she's like oops it's us <laughs> yeah okay yeah. Oh, uh, no you meant that person yeah <laughs> <laughs> no i'm silly so, what do you mean it's my job ah work it's not in my job description anyway right. <laughs> okay. oh, no, i see I... I see all right so tell us about uh, wicked agility a bit more Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. So she said, I don't know where to start from wicked agility other than let's start off with this. Okay. Cause there's this major challenge with the word wicked and I'm not sure how it is in, um, you guys are in New Zealand right now. Right. Um, yeah, but wicked. New Zealand and That's yeah, wicked. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, but some for in some, and I had a really hard time with that word. Right. So um, the, so I have to explain this because it's really important to understand. So wicked is actually, um, wicked is because of wicked problems, right? So I chose wicked, pro wicked because of wicked problems. Well, that's one thing. I also chose wicked because it's wicked. And so I have, and you can notice like I'm a, I can be a really animated, um, person. I've got this lots of passion within me. Um, um, and um, so I wanted, I chose the word wicked because it, it represents um, wicked problems and it has an energy passion for to it, right? So, and um, that's what I wanted. I want people energized around this because this is what we're trying to do is pretty, pretty um, serious stuff. So um, I don't know if you guys know what a wicked problem is, but maybe oh, yeah. what I should do. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know what it is, right? Should, no, no, should but define. we can't assume that the, the, the public yeah. knows, right? So just because yeah. we know and then we talk in <laughs> jargon, no good. So please yeah. explain. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, wicked problems are uh, very uh, complex, gnarly problems. So they're problems which um, have um, multiple symptoms, can have multiple solutions, um, can have multiple stakeholders, uh, requires a diversified team to actually work on it. Um, and it's something that um, we may never solve in our lifetime we can only engage in it. So um, it requires people to kind of like chip away at that specific problems. And, and every single time I think about it, I, I keep on thinking of our lovely David Snowden and his Kinefin framework, right? When he talks about complex problems, it's in that complex domain. And there I might say it might be in the middle, but I, I think it's in the complex side. And he's got some, some cool tools where we want to like probe sense and, and then respond, right? Um, so, and, you know, there's no clear, clear way to, to figure this out. And it's not an expert that's going to, there is no expert of a wicked problem. Mm -hmm. It's where things emerge from, right? So examples of that are climate change, right? Is, um, poverty is inequality is racism is access to, you know, clean water, right? Um, like for some of the places in the world that don't have access to clean water, it, it's child, it's trafficking, uh, people, human trafficking, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, things that have been going on for centuries like that. It's just, and, um, and, um, and so it's those things that may just may not actually get solved within our, our lifetime. So, um, that's what my, the definition of a wicked problem is for me, um, and then um, the reason why I, I, you know, wicked agility and what I'm, what I'm so, uh, maybe I can give you a bit of a background as to why I, 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 you know, came across wicked agility too. It's just, so <laughs> Steve Mowbray actually asked us after the Agile 2022 panel conference, why he goes, why do you think you are the one that actually can come in here and do this thing that you guys want to do around planetary challenges? Um, and for me, when I like uh, the beginning of, of the of uh, the lockdown during for COVID, 
um, I got to a pretty dark, dark place. And, and I'm sure I'm not the only person that kind of went through that particular place. And um, for me, um, it became a space of I was losing hope in humanity. Mm. Um, because there's just, you know, in my mind, um, which is can be a little bit traumatic at sometimes, but it just felt like I was losing hope because people just, it was just so much chaos that was going on. There's so much, you know, um, just it's, it was just too, it was really hugely chaotic. Um, and at that particular point in time, I, I had processed, I have a great coach, which I processed the stuff with. And I realized at that particular point in time, the person that had hope um, was myself. Right. And if I knew if I had hope and I can make a difference, I know I'm not the only one. I know that there's others that are out there. And I had a conversation with actually, I was with Lisa that year in February. Um, and we were talking about how, and we're, we were just discussing about how we could potentially, um, uh, you know, how Atlas are, would be amazing in, um, some of the climate issues that we have right now, like mm. in, in Australia, at that particular point in time, Australia was going through all the, all the fires, right? And we're going like, oh my gosh, like it hit me at that point in time. If you put us into disaster uh, situations, you know, we, we, we know what the power of teams can do, mm. right? And we know how we could potentially uh, chip away. We, we're not the experts at, you know, fires and all that. Maybe some of us are, I'm not speaking for everyone, but you know, we're not the experts, but we certainly know how to create great teams, right? And we know how to chip away at problems. And we know what like a great leader is like, right? That can create a, an amazing uh, um, empowered team. So like, to me, I was like going, yeah, this, we could actually do something about that. So, um, and I was also working with a group, uh, which is their uh, group called Wicked Elephants in Australia, actually, um, and, and marvelous, marvelous set of ladies who are also trying to figure out ways that, to chip away at the wicked problems which are out there. So it just seemed to happen all around the same time. And it came to me, what can I do? And the thing that I, I can do is create communities. Um, so, and what I can see is I know that our, us as Agilists have the capability to do this. And, and I, like, I am just so, I'm like so sure, right? Because I've seen it, <laughs> that we have the capability to, to bring together and harness the power of a diverse team, right? Mm -hmm. We have the capability to kind of like create and, and work with leaders to become amazing, wicked leaders. I'll call them wicked leaders because they know who they are. They know what they're doing. They know their why. They know how to inspire others, right? They're committed right? You know, they, they are really, um, and like, when I think of wicked leaders, you know, they have that um, passion and that um, perseverance, right? Like they know how to take care of themselves because they want to perse persevere at that specific problem that they're dealing with, right? Which can take a long time if we're talking about wicked problems. And we're problem solvers, right? So we're wicked problem solvers. So it, it really made sense to me that there, there was a marriage between wicked problems and, um, and agility. And so that's why I, 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 I said, okay, great. This is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna form something called Wicked Agility. So, so that's where the word came from. But what is it that it's, you know, sure, I'm passionate about wicked teams, wicked leaders and wicked problem solving, um, but what is it that I'm trying to do? And so what I'm trying to do right now is to be able to take the way that we uh, work on problems in our corporations and uh, chipping away at problems and all the things around teams and leaders and take it into our local communities. So if, if we can actually chip away at things locally, right, then we can create hope globally, right? So, so I just, I just wanna go into these local spaces. So uh, at Agile 2022, I kind of came out there and I go, hey, I have a bridge. <laughs> I see a gap and I see we can do this and we need to go in our communities. And I've actually been talking to a lot of people out there in the communities. I do, um, I do Wicked and Agile interviews. And so mm. I talked to people who are out there uh, and actually I had talked to a person in a local community up in Collingwood. Uh, uh, she's a... Um, 
she's in government there. She's a government official. And so I was asking about what are the problems that she has, right? And so, and um, and how are you guys working on it? And, I, and as I sat down there listening to what she was doing, I could sit there and go, yep, we can, we can, we can work with that. You know, yeah, we can help we've got, that. We we've got that. tools, we've got skills. We've got yeah. so many tools and we got so many skills. And you know what? They do too. Mm. Like that was the other thing. I was like, when I was talking to all these people in the different communities, it became, oh my gosh, you have the capability of doing that. Oh, I did, that's amazing, right? Like when we think about disasters, right? Sometimes we think it's chaotic. It's completely chaotic. But when you talk to, like I talked to a 911 operator and I, and I talked to her, they have a plan, right? Mm. So there's a there's very there's steps that they actually take like in their training clear the roads first then do this first so they know what they need to do in the situations it's the unknowns which pop out of that that they don't know how to kind of work at that they have to kind of um, work through but they know how to make it safe and all that stuff right um so um but it's even in the disaster recovery situations you can see us kind of like i said we can i know that we can be in that particular space for sure with the teams which are there as well to help them um when they're you know persevering through the, the challenges that they're going through so anyways that's sort of the the thought the thought process that i have is to create this 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 community and so at agile 2022 we actually talked about the different projects that people are actually doing different work and um and what they're doing locally within their communities so and just amazing other um other panelists which are there uh talking about what they're doing like sudan sally alada is doing a bunch of projects in sudan um where she's she's helping rebuild the government there um and she's brought in a lot of the practices that she's known to to help with that and uh um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's just, just one example, but there's a lot more, right? So, and, and that's the other thing I know too, people who are agilists are doing things in their local communities, right? Mm. We just need to connect them together, right? We need to have the ability to inspire stories, inspire each other and learn from each other and then share this because we can light this up. We can world, we can light up the world, right? Mm. With all of these things that we're doing everywhere, right? And, um, and create that network. And so that's my that's my vision. Uh, I and but the thing is, I know that may be stopping a lot of people um, is is ambition, right? They may not have the and and I make up in my mind that um, they don't know the steps to take. They may not have the time to do it right now, right? Mm -hmm. um, they it may be. Um, they it, that it's it's hard to actually uh, they have to pay you know they have to ha put food on their table right so you know for them to kind of help out locally it may cost them money right so mm -hmm. like if, so what I need to do and what I want to figure out and uh, we're doing a world cafe on September the 10th this is what we want to figure out like what is it that we need to do to kind of help create this community right like mm -hmm. what a problem in itself right. <laughs> um, but what is it that we need to do to kind of even chip away at that problem so we can get it going right so yeah so there's a lot that's there and it's a big mountain to climb and i'm not saying it's a it's something easy but i, I can definitely see see that we can do it and i, and I know we can like i i have the yes i think i can feel it <laughs> like it's so excited about it but yeah yeah one of the things you mentioned there joanne is uh there's a big problem and when people we have we all have a bias uh, biases when we look yes. at something that this big mm -hmm. uh, there's a trigger in us that just shuts us down or makes us flee or whatever and one of the best tricks that we've learned is um break it down into smaller pieces as possible and show mm -hmm. the links between what can I do now to achieve that sometime in the ethereal future? Um, mm -hmm. I want to. I want to come back. We spoke about tools um, and 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 skill in in using those tools, even in domains that we don't know about. And one thing I've yes. noticed um, that 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 we've been um, honing quite a lot over the last number of years. I call it an art. It's the art of asking questions, knowing mm -hmm. what are the right questions to ask, ask 
to trigger the thinking, even if you do not know the domain at all. Yes. Um, how do you think, uh, how important is that art of asking questions to help in this wicked or complex problems that you're talking about? Um, well, I, it's a powerful, look as a coach, it's a very powerful um, tool that we have, right? Um, so there's two, two aspects of it. Um, I see two perspectives. I see one is the person asking the question, mm -hmm. and I also see the perspective of the person that's um, answering it, right? So I, I do think that uh, the power, like the powerful questions that we ask of another, it, if it activates within them the ability to um, uh, come up with different ideas, different solutions, what other, what else, right? What else is here? What else could we do, right? Um, if we took away this, what else could be here? Like um, we can talk about high dreams and low mm. dreams, right? And so when we talk about wicked problems, right? Uh, one of the things with wicked problems um, is that, you know, we want to make sure that um, whatever we put in place, it doesn't make the problem worse, right? So mm. we want to be able to look at, you know, what, what else, what, what else could potentially impact here? And, and mm. so I think, I think it's around when I think of those powerful questions uh, for the person, I think about, um, I, I, that's what comes up for me is the ability to kind of, um, you know, uh, unleash the creative power in oneself because we need more creativity when we're thinking of those things. We can't think with that, um, that ethics sort of mind. We need a very creative mind to think of other things. So I do, do think it come, it helps with that. I, I think for the person that's asking it, um, it forces us to listen. <laughs> Um, and, um, I think that, and it also, uh, like I, I, you know, what happens with me right now, it's even a gulp, I go gulp within myself because I don't know, like, like to, to work in areas of, of any, like in my local, local, uh, community of, of, uh, in Canada and, and with the, um, you know, I gulp because I don't know how to do, uh, uh housing so that it's, it supports, uh, climate, right? Um, um, so I, and so I don't, I don't know. So I have to kind of gulp and I have to kind of like, so it, so it allows me to not try and be that specialist or that person that has to know the answer. Cause I don't know the answer. Right. So, um, it actually allows to, me to calm my system down <laughs> in a way, um, and, and allow for even my mind to open up to other possibilities, which are out there. Um, so, uh, so that's what sort of came up to me when you asked that question. Okay. I'm sure okay. you can see others as well. Like the power of those questions <clears throat> are just amazing. Right. Yeah. No, I I've seen it. Um, during the um the the aftermath of the lockdowns there was a lot of local um community groups that got started up here in new zealand people mm -hmm. wanting to do something in the community together as a community uh, a mm -hmm. lot of people lost their jobs and you know so there was quite a lot of these types of communities that came up and i had the privilege of helping to um even though I didn't know anything about what they were doing, the one group was teachers and the other group was a, 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 a online marketplace. Um, mm -hmm. And what was really fascinating is, is that the tools that we used for chartering, I took those tools into the discussions and we charted out those initiatives. And it just naturally gave me the opportunity to ask those deep thinking questions of something that mm -hmm. these people wanted to do, but having the ability to support them just through asking these deep questions. And you could sense the energy change every time. It's like, oh, this is so big. And then you ask just this one little question and then the, the whole energy changes. People got ignited, inspired, and the answers just flowed quite quickly. Um, so never underestimate the value uh, for our uh, listeners. Um, the value of asking good questions is an art and 
it's a life skill. I believe it's an absolute life skill to have. I want to move on to something else you said earlier. Sorry, Joanne, you wanted to say something. Yeah, you noticed it because I was just so excited. I was going like, because what you just talked about is an example of, of something that us as Agilists do in our local community. Mm. So that is precisely a project that I would want other people to know of and hear of. And you, you've you done it. Like you did, I didn't need to understand the to be a teacher or anything like that. And you looked, you brought two tools, chartering and asking powerful questions. And um, you brought that in and, and what amazing things happen. So th this is a story. So I'm going to flip a podcast on you, buddy. I'm going to bring you into mine. <laughs> <laughs> because honestly, you know, and what you're, you just got me thinking too, is that when I say wicked problems, I'm not asking people to be solving climate change in their local community. That may not be the issue that's happening. Mm -hmm. It may be the fact that the community is having a problem finding jobs. <clears throat> or there's a lot of mental health issues which are happening. They are all symptoms of these large wicked problems, right? Yeah. And yeah. so, and it's like, we can we can make a difference in those specific areas. So I, I'm, thank you for even, for sharing that. That's wonderful. Very good, very good. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, I'll have more coffee when you interview me next time. So okay, in, okay. In my... <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah, or yeah, you wanted to jump in here. Yeah. yeah um so much richness in what we're covering so um, i wanted to clarify you mentioned earlier these amazing uh, wicked leaders if you will mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i would add to the qualities that you described a few other qualities that are equally important for mm -hmm. an effective wicked leader and that mm -hmm. has to do with how do they engage with their own ego because a mm -hmm. wicked leader is humble. A wicked leader is mm -hmm. empathetic. A wicked mm -hmm. leader is compassionate. A wicked leader mm -hmm. is caring. Because a wicked leader isn't about, oh, look at me. I am such a glorious leader. I'm solving all these wicked problems all by yeah. myself. Oh, uh -huh. glory to me kind of thing. No, 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 no. <laughs> a wicked leader mm -hmm. is about uh, us achieving great things in community, in a good collaboration, mm -hmm. in challenging each other, and not mm -hmm. in saying, it's my idea, mine, mine, all mine, mwah, 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 yeah, mwah, ha, ha, I'm taking over the world. No, <laughs> wicked leadership is about nurturing connection and, and yeah. learning together as opposed to it's about me, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So No, I love it. Thank you. I, I thought Thank that you. that needed a bit of, <laughs> of reminder. Oh, no, I stopped myself in describing it because I was going, oh my gosh, I'm going to go into a big spiel. Um, but you said it so eloquently and there's more, right? Like I just, I love what you're saying, like the humbleness, the compassion, the inspirational aspect of it, knowing themselves, knowing what triggers themselves, yeah. right? And knowing how to be, um, you know, we all have triggers. Yeah. We all do, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And um, knowing, you know, when, you know, we need to clean up ourselves clean up our acts because the impacts that we have we're not perfect right yeah. so um but uh yeah no i love it i, I love well, it and equals always there <laughs> see you say that like it's a thing yeah. that you're not perfect but uh, quite a lot of people don't seem to share that opinion some people there's, think i'm perfect as i am Thank yeah you there's much. nothing wrong with me yeah, yeah exactly i'm perfect <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's actually interesting. That's a perspective, right? I guess that perspective for me keeps me humble. There you um, go. <laughs> but the, the perspective for others of I'm perfect, just maybe it helps them keep them whole, right? To say, I, I don't need anything. I'm, I'm good the way I am. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, there's different it, perspectives. I'm uh, mm, Interesting. It's an yeah. interesting challenge, yeah? Now, yeah, 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 sure. talking about perspective and framing, <laughs> Yeah. Around wicked problem solving. Here's the here's an idea. I think mm -hmm. we have a challenge in how we use language because we talk yeah. about wicked problem solving, mm -hmm. and that gives us very much a, a linear frame. Right? Mm -hmm. Here's the problem. Here's the solution. Here's the problem. Mm -hmm. Here's the solution. Mm -hmm. When in fact, what we're dealing with is not problem solving, but opportunity and experimentation opportunity mm -hmm. and experimentation because we don't know what the solution is to Correct. so we need to find an opportunity 
to mm -hmm. move the needle hopefully in the direction that we want and run an experiment and then see how well that experiment fits. Because as we've run that experiment, we've changed the whole system. So, whoa, things tip differently. So what used to be a good idea now is no longer yeah. such a great idea, right? I think you're, you're making me think of uh, that maybe there's a new name and it's it's maybe it's Wicked Experimenters. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I love it. <laughs> that, that, that takes us away from... Whew, we've put the solution in. Ah. We're fine. No, yeah, we're not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're at it. Yeah. yeah. Right? I love it. Love it. Yeah. And, I face that I... right now. Actually, it's interesting because I face that and I am in a part of a business agility transformation um, in, um, in, a, in a bank within um, Toronto area. And um, we're trying to stay away from that word word problem. We're trying mm -hmm. to go into like opportunities right? and more experimentation so that we can learn, right? Exactly. So and today's, today's solution may cause tomorrow's problems as well. So you've got to have a mechanism to continuously do whatever or yeah. you just explained. There's the yeah. classic story of the unintended consequences, the cats in Borneo <laughs> video on, on YouTube. I don't know if you've come across it, right? No, no. So the story is uh, people in Borneo say, hey, we're suffering from malaria. Let's call the World Health Office. The World Health Office says, oh, we have a solution for this. Spray with DDT. OK, cool. All right. We get some DDT. We spray with DDT. OK, mosquitoes die. Uh, malaria abated. Oh, victory. We have the solution. However, spray with DDT, you also um, kill some wasps that the wasps used to eat the larvae that now, because there are no wasps, the larvae eat the thatched roofs of people's houses. So roofs of houses start to cave in because we sprayed with DDT. Uh <laughs> uh, okay, problem, roofs of houses uh, caving in. And not only that, but geckos start to eat uh, little insects that are full of DDT. Geckos accumulate a lot of DDT. Cats eat geckos, cats die from poisonous geckos, cats die, rabbits multiply, rabbits multiply, plague ensues, right? No, help, 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 plague, lots of rats, because we sprayed with DDT, <laughs> right? yeah, it's, it's, So what do we do? <laughs> Wicked problem solved, airdrop yeah. cats in Borneo, literally, they got planes with... <laughs> I kid you not, airdrop cats. <laughs> so you eat the rats. So, you, so, so that's what I'm talking about. Unintended consequences and wicked problem solving oh, yeah. 50 years yeah. ago, right? Wow. <laughs> so. But isn't that the case? That's such a, it's a such a, a that's a, uh, I hate to say a plague in it itself where, um, and it's a very normal human thing where we, 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 want, we, we, we go straight to solution without mm. understanding what the problem is. Right. It's like yeah. this, you know, we go, we think this is the answer to it. I don't know if this community is the answer to it. Right. I have no clue. And so everything that I'm doing in the, in this space, I'm learning, I'm doing validated learning. I'm like, Oh, yeah. what do we need to do? I don't know. Is this working? How do I know it's working? You know, what experiment do I need to do next? Because that's the only way I'm going to chip away at this, right. Is to, to, to get this up and going. If in fact, it's an, it's an experiment. It, it is an experiment to me. Right. Because I don't know if I have the right solution. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and that's what we found doing chartering slows the uh, slows a lot of the um, the knee jerk reactions. Oh, we do this. Oh, we do this. It slows it down so that we mm -hmm. can actually have the space to make informed decisions about what it is that we need to do, about what is the problem we're actually solving. So mm -hmm. I want to I want to shift a little bit here. You've mentioned it uh, earlier in the call a few times. Um, you your role as a middle child, um, yeah. being being Switzerland, um, <laughs> being um, being neutral uh, when you have warring factions, uh, mm -hmm. and even in your career, um, how have you how have you how you have used that skill um, mm -hmm. in in your career in the big telecom. Mm -hmm. um so first question and i'll have a follow-up question is is how important is neutrality in the workplace it's a very uh, obvious question but how important it is maintaining neutrality in the workplace it's a really important it's really hard to do <laughs> i'll tell you that one um so um to me um neut the neutrality where 
what comes up for me when we start talking about neutrality is that um, I am not coming in with any biases. I'm just listening to what's happening. I am listening to what's here, what's right now. And I'm not necessarily taking sides. So I'm not mm -hmm. like, you know, have you, this is better than this is better. It, it, like, and so what the, the thing that popped up in my mind is like, you know, let's do safe because it's the, it's the thing that's gonna answer everything. It's a framework that's gonna answer anything. I hold it as a framework and I think that's great, but I also hold a perspective that, you know, it may not do that, what it says. So like, I'm very much this, this type of person who um, will um, keep a, 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 a very neutral stance in anything that we do. Cause I'm not really, I, I'm never kind of like, yeah, this is gonna be, this is gonna be the solution or this is not gonna be a solution or this person, has the right answer or doesn't so it's just like it, it helps me stay grounded and and open to anything else that's out there um and i think too the neutrality has allowed me to kind of um and it's such a hard thing to do because again i'm only human right um uh, it, it it it's given me this sort of like uh stance where um i guess i've become more of a trusted person because I'm not going towards one person or the other person or one solution versus another solution. Um, I, I go in there with an open mind of knowing it could be this or it could be that, right? Um, so um, so like I, I call myself the middle ground because I, I see that there's a, you, know, you guys are talking about in your in your model that you have, right? There's a tension that that's there. There's always mm -hmm. a tension. There's a tension between the business and IT. There's a tension between, you know, uh, my ego and myself all the time. Like, geez, it wakes me up every morning and tells me I shouldn't drink, right? And I go, what the heck? I know, what the heck? my glass of wine, it relaxes me at night, you know? Uh, so, um, but it, it's like, it's just, it's just knowing that, that it's there and, um, and, uh, and for me, um, it's seeing, it's, it's, I'm able to see what's, what's happening uh, in that particular space. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but that's what I see in terms of neutrality. And that's what so, comes, comes up for me. So my follow-up question on that is, is that when you're in an oversight situation, you run yeah. the risk of being <laughs> wildly influenced by biases or tradition or whatever. What do you think uh, people or AO practitioners can do to maintain a neutral stance or maintain neutrality. So it's it's actually interesting. Like the the thing that I'll give you an example that um, uh, I often will have uh, with when I work with um, when you talk about oversight and governance, for example, right? Um, so um, I work I work with, uh, when you start talking about business agility, it's it's like it's across the whole enterprise, right? Um, and so uh, when I work with uh, teams that we have governance, that there's, there's, we, there's you know, there's certain uh, laws that we need to support, security laws, or it could be, um, uh, stock exchange laws, or it could be sustainable. It could be a bunch of different things which are there. So there's some oversight or some sort of governments which are there. So, but if I, what I want to do is I want to work in these, uh, a cadence of one week. Uh, mm. And the way that they work is typically when I say they, the, the governance team may only work, you know, like in projects which are, you know, have all the information up front, for example. Um, uh, and so, you know, they need a more detailed plan, a detailed understanding of what you're doing for privacy, for everything, right? And so it's very difficult that like, we may not have the, the state that we're at with this particular project that we're working on, may not have the information at that particular point in time with the team, with the governance team. So what I typically do is I, I will talk to the governance team. I'll, I'll understand them a little bit better. And, and this is the whole thing is I, I am empathetic for everybody. Everybody has a role right? Your role is to do this. Your role is to do that. Your role is to do this. Yes, we're creating tension. We're, we're doing something different that the system is not used to doing. But still, the role as auditors, the role of, of, of the folks who are here, they have a specific role in the organization. If it's to make us feel safe or make the, you know, someone feels, whatever it is that there is, there's a specific role, okay? 
I think what happens though, and, and see, even I've talked to governance people in the past as well. I think sometimes what happens is, is, you know, they're just, they're also trying to figure out easier ways of working, by the way, they're mm. open. Like a lot of them are open, but, but we, we, we think they're so rigid, right? Because they have these rules, but the thing is they created those rules, by the way, based on how we deliver projects many years ago. Right. Mm. And so, and so it can change based on how we're delivering stuff now. And it actually can be a lot better. Right. And it just requires us to have that conversation because we, we have in our mind that because they put these things into place, they're fixed. They've got a fixed mindset. No. Right. They're, they're not fixed. Right. Mm. They, they have a specific role. They have a specific, you know, um, you shall not pass type of, uh, you know, a uh, thing where you cannot, um, you have to be able to have these things. Um, but you know what? They're reasonable. So, you know, I would, I always go in there thinking that these guys are reasonable people. I go in there understanding where they're coming from, how they actually work, you know, what got, why, why uh, the, they're doing the job the way that they're doing now. Could we do anything different that will help them, but still keep what they're doing intact, right? Because there's a there's core things which are there, right? And sometimes mm. even the like I work in a lot of large corporations, guys. So I have to sit there and say, usually these governance groups, you know, they are they are been told by another group that's been told by another group. And so it's usually the lawyers that, and then the next group that tells, you know, that kind of looks at creating the policies or whatever, that, that gives it off to the auditors or whatever to do. And so what, um, what um, I realized is that the, even when you look at SOX compliance and some of the other stuff that's out there, um, when it comes from the government, it's very gray. It's not specific. And so what happens is someone interprets it as black and white because it's easy for people to kind of follow, right? And so really it's all about going back to the state to kind of go, well, if we have this way of working, how can we make it a lot easier, right? So. Mm. And we and I have changed a lot of things and I've worked with them hand in hand because we need all of them. Right. We need mm. all of them to do our stuff. And and because of that, they're more open to and be willing to kind of um, share and, and change and support the way that we're working. Right. So I think compassion. Sorry, I, I guess the bottom line is, is to me, I think. We need to think we need to be compassionate with what they're doing. They have a specific role and, and it's about being compassionate, understanding with them, not thinking that they have a fixed mindset because they have the specific role. Mm -hmm. um, go in there just be, being curious, right? You know, mm -hmm. what else is here? What is it that what's the minimal thing that we need to do, right? And even helping them out if you have to find other auditors or find other governance people around the world and go, you know what, they've done this. So you know, here's here, you know, here's some stuff you want. You want this, you know, like, um, yeah, do what you can do to help them out. Anyways, that's what that's what comes up for me when you ask that. Wonderful. Thank you, Joanne. Um, oh, you're that, that's uh, some, some really good tips uh, and, and, and tricks there. Um, I've got another question. You you spoke about your role um, early on in your career as a developer and then transitioning into program management. Um, so. What we notice is a lot of people can be brilliant technical people, uh, brilliant technical people, and because of that brilliance, they get promoted into a, a, a people role, and then it all falls apart. Right. Um, now, what do you think uh, oversight functions or practitioners can do to help? people with these transitions? Um, so first off, um, that's a very normal um, uh, spot, a normal thing that happens all over the world, right? It, it's just the maturity of, of, of people when they go through. So it's a very normal thing to kind of go from expert to a leadership, leadership role. Um, uh, there's a really great book, um, which is called um, uh, Agile Leader uh, Leadership Agility, I think it is. I think it's, where do I have it? Uh, yeah, Leadership Agility. It's a really cool book. And it actually talks about the different stages that most people go through. 
Um, and it does talk about this particular uh, expert um, kind of leader. And um, I, I, what I do think that, um, like, what can we do to support them? What can we do to kind of get them to the next stage or whatever? The biggest challenge is um, we can, we can, you know, if they're open to it and they're open to understanding, then that's great, right? But sometimes the experts, they don't know, um, they, they, they won't know what to look for until they actually hit the problem, right? So, we, and we as coaches can't coach people who don't think that, that, that there's a, a, a challenge or a problem that they have. So experts are experts because they feel that they've got it. They've done it. They're really good at it. They're mm. solid, right? And they are really solid at the practice that they're doing. But now you move them into a leadership role. And my gosh, you know, it was really great as a developer. I went into a leadership role and not knowing how to lead, right? Um, you know, we had great training where I was at. To talk, we talked about how to actually do it, how to work with people, um, but geez, it, it didn't prepare me for the one role I had where, you know, I had to hire a hundred people and my team kept on leaving all the time. And so there's huge churn and, you know, I was, I was not set up to, to, to succeed as it was just, there was, there was, there was a total oversight it was totally missed there. Right. Where the leader thought I had it and I didn't. Right. Um, so, um, you know, I think some of this is, is, is when we, when we talk about oversight, um, perhaps, you know, some things that can be done is, um, is, 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 is having a coach, uh, for sure. I think a coach for that, that particular person is always good. I think that, um, we all have some fears and so, and um, it's working with them to kind of work through what what they what their fears are, what their high dreams are, what their low dreams are, and kind of start working through for this particular position. What do you think it may be? Um, and then um, having a mentor or someone else that that supports them as they go through it. I think that you know, as 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 um, as, and I wish I had this actually when I, I first became a, a manager. Um, it is sort of like this. Um, reflective and adapting uh, capability, right? Like, let's go in, let's figure out, well, what is it that, you know, I want to want to learn or what is it that I need to understand first before I go into this, this next step, right? So, um, and so having the ability to kind of like constantly um, have this plan, do, check, act type of, uh, mm. of, of sense um, would be helpful. Um, I just, I, I also know that if I was to throw, I keep on, I, I went through a leadership program um, and by Coactive um, uh, uh, CTI. It was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. Um, and I would want my kids to do it too, um, because it really grew me as a leader. But mm -hmm. the thing is, there's people that were in it that just weren't ready. They were so young, right? They just hadn't gone through the experiences, right? They hadn't felt them yet. Yeah. Um, so it's, there's this aspect of, we just have to wait until they stumble sometimes, right. Um, to kind of help them. Um, but it doesn't mean that we can't put things into place for them. It, we can't put in safety nets for them. You know, we can definitely give them some training, um, maybe just, just, you know, a bit at a time. Right. So, um, and I, I guess it's very individual uh, as the other thing too, right? So yes, there's no cookie cutter recipes. So. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, like I think when I so I, I do actually, you're getting me to think about um, when I work with leaders and when I start working with some uh, the programs that I do within large organizations, and I'll work. I have like a nine month program that I do. The first three months is all about me as a person. Right. Mm -hmm. So the stuff I'll go through them is like, so what are your values? Right. Um, what are your saboteurs? Um, if you guys are familiar with positive intelligence. Right. Mm -hmm. I'll go through, you know, this, you know, even we may go through I am types. Right. Um, and so that they get to understand how their communication style is and how they communicate with others. Right. Um, we'll do things like the responsibility process with, with Christopher Avery, Christopher Avery's responsibility process, which is absolutely brilliant, right? Wow. And so, um, but this is what I do with, with when I'm looking at coaches, like people who, are, who, are, uh, who want to become coaches, I'll go through a bunch of these um, different techniques and tools that I have. 
um, just to kind of like, and what you're saying, Horia, is like, we, there's this aspect of our, our self, we don't know well, uh, really well about, right? So, um, and so working with some of these leaders and talking to them about who they are, and so they get to understand them, who they are a little bit better, um, it, it's been freeing, right? It's been totally freeing. Like I've, you know, I feel like I've freed so many people. <laughs> it's like, you know, because because now they understand who they are and what they want, right, and what they don't want, and then off they go, right. So, anyways, I could talk for hours on this. Yeah, we'll very see. good. It's wonderful <laughs> to see the, the the energy. Now, um, one thing that I find really encouraging in your initiative around wicked agility and this general intention is the following. Too often, humanity has suffered catastrophically as a result of, as a less than well-inspired, glorious idea. Mm. Yeah? Mm. We've had the Bolshevik revolution. Mm. Why? Because mm. uh, the proletariat is oppressed. Mm. We must do well for the proletariat. We must end the oppression. Wonderful. Yes. As a result of that, millions upon millions upon millions of people have died horrible deaths. Millions upon millions upon millions of people have lived really gruesomely painful lives. All in the service of, there are this many people that are suffering. We must end their suffering. We must help the vast masses. Oops, the ambition is too broad, too vague, too foggy to actually lead to, to something demonstrably nurturing and flourishing and prospering. Yeah, so that is not a good path. We've run this experiment a number of times through human history. Let's cease and desist from this foolishness. Yeah, I don't wish we, we should do this thing. Yeah. exactly <laughs> i don't know what to do i, don't, I know See, what the possibilities are i don't know and yeah. that's the point the point is what you're saying with wicked agility is forget the whole freaking jalopy it's too big yeah let's focus yeah. us here this small community of people let's learn together what works here yes we can yeah. have a glorious vision a glorious ambition but we have the humility to say we don't have the answer for everybody we're not attempting to confiscate stuff off of people, yeah, to no. say, we know better than you, you must do this. No, 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 no. We actually trust us here, facing this challenge here, to notice, to pay attention, and look at our context and notice what is most worth doing for us here. What are our hearts and our minds and our spirits telling us, wow, this matters. This is important. Let's do this now. Because it's, oh, I got to do it. You know what, Hori, when you started talking about that, I what kept keeps on coming up with me is that um, this this way of working isn't the way we are together right now. It's not working anymore. It's like we have to go back to old, older ways. Mm -hmm. We have to so, go back to the ways of tribes. We have to go back to the ways of community, right? Um, yeah. So... There's a beautiful story about Mother Teresa. Um, mm. It was some disaster in a neighboring country where, um, I, and I don't know the exact details of the story, but Mother Teresa had already fame um, and they thought, oh, we had this disaster. Let's fly her in and get her to come help us deal with this disaster. Mm. And when she got there, they all looked at her as like, okay, what, what, what is it that we need to do? And she looked at them and stayed quiet, walked to a, a, a house that was collapsed, that there that they, was some rubble, there was a broom lying around. She picked up the broom and just started sweeping up. And then suddenly these people had ideas. Oh. I can do this. Oh, I can do that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's how the whole 
disaster relief effort just evolved naturally on its own. Such a beautiful story to what Aurea just explained. So I couldn't help but not share it. So, um, But it, it explains that sometimes it just takes us to pick up a broom and start sweeping. You know, and I have to sit there and say, we, we get into, if I, I share one more story, I'm sorry. <laughs> not, not that it's I'm going to share it. Um, so uh, I don't know if you ever heard of a guy named Jose Andres. Um, he is uh, he is a founder of the World Central Kitchen. And uh, so he went into, um, for example, he went into Ukraine recently. Uh, he's a, a Michelin chef. He would go in and he would um, help out when there's disasters and he would bring warm food, right? Um, he's got a really great book. I've seen a lot of his videos and stuff like that. And uh, one of the books that he had, he wrote was uh, um, about feeding an island. And so he went down to an island that um, uh, is Puerto Rico um, that basically had a, um, it was a hurricane that went through and just, just everything got blown away and all that kind of stuff. So um, I don't think he knows anything about agility. And if you're listening to this, I, <laughs> I, I think he just has a lot of common sense, right? Mm. But he went in there to go and see what he can do. He knew he was a chef. He can't, he didn't know exactly what he what he was getting into. Within two days, he got up whatever little equipment he did he had and just went. He had no plan. He just went, right? Some of the biggest challenges that he had was the was the mindset of the of, of the the government of the US government the 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 army you know we're just going to we're just going to give them dry food and water we're just going to you know and it's so and you know they're 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 bickering in the bureaucracy right where he all he needed was some money to get you know help get um some um, uh, local food and you know help help you know the help everyone help each other type of thing and so it was pretty interesting just when you looked at his story and what he did is, you know, he like, I guess my point is the bureaucracy that's out there is actually sometimes is, 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 is stopping people from doing the right thing to pick up the friggin' broom just to pick up the broom. Right. Mm -hmm. And what he did is he just went out there every day. His whole thing was, I'm going to do the double amount of sandwiches and hot meals that I did the other day. And geez, if the government's not going to help me, I'm going to talk to the local chefs and, you know, and I'm going to take out a $10,000. I've got $10,000. It's all I can have. And so he worked with the local distribution centers and he talked to people. He talked to people to figure out what he needed to do next. It was talking to people. It was picking up the bloody broom. Yes. It wasn't the government trying to figure out, you know, how I should fly in here, who, which politician has, you know, whatever. It was, you know, these are things that have worked in the past uh, for me when I was doing it here. It, there was no, like, there was just, it was just, I hate to say it, almost like a fixed mindset, right? Mm. Um, and this, this guy went out there and this is what he did. And he actually taught the locals how do you, it, to use and feed themselves and feed the uh, feed and, and help support the rest of the community, right? So he wasn't doing it on his own. He used the power of teams. Oh my gosh, he is like Horia, a wicked leader. Like no, like he had everything. It was just this perfect example. And I, I love when I, he has some videos that are out there. He has stickies on the walls, and he has one, one thing. like he used visualization. He knew how to bring a team together. He knew how to and ask the right question. It was just, it's glorious to see. I love that example of Mother Teresa. But that's just that's what got me triggered into kind of going. And that's why, I, like, I know there's people that are out there that can do it. Mm. I really do. And, and this is, I think, one of the things that oversight. Uh, people in an oversight role needs to understand is sometimes or many times you need to step away from the role and look at it from a human perspective it is what is the practical thing to do so you need a healthy dose of practicality you have yeah. all the understanding of what what is what is oversight trying or governance trying to prevent but you yeah. also have to remain practical about what is applicable in that context at that moment in time. You can always recover from things as well, but it, what's the most needed in that moment in time? So mm -hmm. um, I think that's Health from... Is really important, yes. Yeah. So a healthy dose or a healthy balance with uh, pragmatism and practical thinking mm -hmm. goes a really long way 
then you don't become the enemy. Then you become mm -hmm. the, the, the leader. You become that wicked leader. Gloria, mm -hmm. you wanted to say. Yeah, yeah um, I wanted to echo um, Joanne's thoughts on the ways of the tribes. But let me give you some examples of which ways of the tribes we're talking about. Because it's mm -hmm. not the ways of the tribes of, oog, oog, I shall smash you over the head with this big rock, right? That is yeah. one of the ways of the tribes, right? Because you're in that tribe and I hate you. And, 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 this, and I'm, uh, yeah, see, yeah. so that is also the way of the tribes. But that's not what we're talking about in terms of the, way no. that the, the ways of the tribes. What we're talking about is more, um, I'll give some examples from New Zealand. New Zealand has a wonderful uh, native community of uh, the Maori, yeah? So the Maori have really fascinating uh, concepts and perspectives on life. So the, the Maori collectively, they are tangata whenua. They are the, the people of the land. Mm -hmm. They have such a deep connection with nature, with, um, with reality, and they're not alone. Um, uh, the, the native of North America, natives of North America have very similar uh, senses of unity with, with the land, with, with yes. nature. The um, <clears throat> Aborigines in Australia talk about exactly the same idea of unity in the dreaming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this idea of when you introduce yourself in New Zealand, you say, and I am of this iwi, I am of this mountain, I am of this river. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I am a, a reflection of this, you yeah, know, if I were a wine, this is my terroir kind of thing, <laughs> right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. there's also <clears throat> the concept of whānau. Whānau is the extended family, if you will. And mm -hmm. you don't have to be blood kin to be part of my whānau, right? You are in such close spiritual connection that you adopt us, we adopt you, we are connected. That's the kind of tribe that we're talking about because that's what agility done well is all about. It's about forming us from I'm Joanne, I'm Horia, I'm Aldo, and we're individual people bickering. We're a bunch mm -hmm. of bloquettes and blokes. No, 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 no. Agility done well says, you know what? We can be so much better together. We can be so much more amazing as an awesome team, you know, all blacks kind of awesomeness, right? In mm -hmm. terms of rugby world dominance for many a year, right? So mm -hmm. the, the idea is how do we make strong, really effective communities that can focus well on tricky issues and then run experiments? That's what you're talking about with this wicked agility, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's that. Fano. Then there's the iwi. The iwi is the kind of local tribe, if you will. And then there's the tanga, the fenwa. The... So yeah. there are, if you will, almost like onion layers of, of community and, and ability yeah. to share, right? And I have to sit there and add one thing from our lovely Brene Brown is the feeling of being, feeling like you belong. Mm. That's right. right. Yeah. That's and right. that, that's and that's right. just, and that, you know what, that's what I do for my teams, right? And I want to create a feeling that they belong, right? Um, Collective and, meaning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now I can't do that on my by myself. They naturally mm. start to do that. But if I can create the space where that can happen, it's just wonderful, right? Yeah. It's it's so beautiful when you start seeing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> um, we've got time for one more uh, topic to to unpack. Um, and we wanted to uh, go a little bit. I, I, I have a few questions that I've over, over the talk have, have captured. So the, you, you seemed uh, quite passionate about uh, talking about how bureaucracy stops progress uh, mm -hmm. from happening in disaster areas, etc. Mm -hmm. And earlier on, in your uh, river of life you also talked about the slowness of change um, more bureaucracy lots more processes in the uh, customer that you're busy helping with mm -hmm. what is it that you think that from an oversight perspective can be done to get better at not being the obstacle but being the way or 
um, not being the, the the dam wall, but being the water that flows over it or around it. Oh, that's beautiful. I, I mean, I think we're, uh, I love it because it, it, it's getting me, um, uh, there's an aspect of, and I know more <laughs> else like the ego, it's my way and that's the only way, you know, and, and that's the aspect I feel like. Um, but I, I, I think that there, this is getting back to that, like in the example with Jose Andres and uh, the bureaucratic government, I think they have a place, right? I think there is a place for them. And I think that they have a lot of experience and they have a lot of influence, right? They have a lot of networks. They have a lot of, I hate to say it, a power, right? That's there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh I just what I I would love for the the change to be ha to happen is just being aware of having that overall awareness and loosening of that wall like still stand for you st like like we all stand for something right the government stands for a certain thing I stand for a certain thing you stand for like everyone's I hope stands for something right and getting mm. into passion. So, um, but, and that's okay, right? It's okay, you stand for this and I stand for this, um, but how can we be together and belong? <laughs> like, just like we're talking about, like how can we, and, and, and it's conversation, right? It's just, mm -hmm. and being open and being compassionate and hearing each other out, right? And then figuring out where we might have to bring the walls down a bit, right? um uh, uh to enable this to happen which i think you know it's it's funny um <laughs> it's the this what i when i introduce change and I, everything like that um i do it through like let's just do a little experiment mm -hmm. shall we you know let's not commit to you have to bring down the whole wall guys like let's just try this thing for like you know six weeks and then at the very end, we can re-look at it, re-examine it. Like we, we, we think that if we do this, it's gonna get so much better. Okay, great. Well, let's look at it at the end of so many weeks and see, did it do that? Didn't it? Okay, what do we do next? So maybe it's this whole aspect of being open, but also experiment and innovate and create and like kind of, you know, and do these um, small, small and small iterations, I'll say, um, and, and have the ability if we can have the ability to sit there and say, you know what, we're just going to test and try this thing out, people are more open to it mm. because they still have a choice at the very end of that period to kind of flip into back to where they were, right? So and um, and so I think that 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 is a way to kind of like bring down, I don't want to say bring down the walls, but it's like we chip away at parts of the walls. It's just, we can't take, bring down the whole thing. That's what, what can, what is the best place to go through first, right? Mm -hmm. So being compassionate, hearing each other out, trying experiments, doing something small, um, but, and, and, and acknowledging and hearing everybody out, which is listening and acknowledging that the government has has it has a specific role and I have a role too. Like it just the that acknowledgement um I think is 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 also important so that we can so that we can it's almost like trust or respect each other or there's something there's a connection to deepen the connection, right? So yeah, I said a lot, um, but that's what's that's what kind of came up for me. But my job is is on the line if I'm not the biggest wall and the strongest wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's that's that that's quite possible, right? Like I have, I I have, I I have so many nukes. How many nukes do you have? Yeah. Um, you know, we have to have the same amount of nukes, right? Yeah. Um, yeah um so that's it's uh it, it it happens um and so and then it happens that people won't shift or move or change but i, I don't know how that's helping and, and maybe in some instances it does help in some instances it doesn't so perhaps it's looking at each of the different situations right 
Um, I know that there could be ego involved or ego not involved. I, I don't know in the people situations which are like that, but it's, mm-hmm. I know you're just stating that, but I'm kind of, that really made me kind of go, yeah, okay, that's your role. I mean, I, I'm scared of individuals like that. I'll tell you the truth, right? Mm-hmm. I really am like those immovables, but there's people that are immovable and I have to sit there and go like after a while, like I can't, like if I don't have the power to kind of change that, um, I have to figure out a different way of doing it, maybe going around the immovable, right? So, And that's the question. Who will help us move the immovables? Because they have people in their lives. They have people in their fauna that may be able to help them see a different way of life. They may yeah. be able to help them see, look, if you get too hung up on this, here's the challenge. Here's the implication. Let's walk through this, right? Yeah. So, yes. Uh, sometimes it can't be done. The person is in such dire position uh, politically or emotionally that they will come hell or high water. I take a last stand here. This is the hill I'm going to die on. Mm. Sure. Well, there, there's a status aspect in the you being an influencer to them, right? Like, can I influence them? I might not be at where they think I am at the level where they are at, so I can influence them, right? So, mm. um, you know, I mean, I remember someone telling me, like, because I was going, well, how do I influence my leaders? And there's like, well, Joanne, you know, you have to be a leader to influence a leader. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> took me a while to kind of figure it out but (laughs) um but i expect that for me to influence um cios and and ceos you know um i i wonder can i do that or not but there's other people who can Mm -hmm. so uh for me okay so if i can't do it i'm not gonna let my ego Mm -hmm. kind of like oh joanne you can't do it okay great find someone else Mm -hmm. (laughs) all right who can (laughs) but here 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 is here's the i think the crux of it um when Mm. we work when we work through these things in oversight uh with oversight communities and and teams we talk about fears what is the fear that drives you to behave in this or that way and what can we do to alleviate that fear Mm -hmm. um or what is the collective fear that we all have in Mm -hmm. order to try uh, that 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 dictates how we actually behave in this situation, etc. Mm-hmm. Um, now, ma- manly men don't talk about fear, but uh, it is about understanding what triggers uh, those types of behaviors. And I I think it always sure. comes down to fear. We act out of or we behave out of fear in yeah. many cases. Sure. So, um, as a as a as a tip, um, when we're in these um, controversial situations, let's understand what are the fears driving those behaviors. Um, usually there's quite a lot of hidden things that it's not always uh, visible. And then tapping into your tribe or your fano, um, finding out what is going on behind the scenes that mm-hmm. drives this types of fear response in, in this mm-hmm. individual. Mm-hmm. So our role as a facilitator is to be able to get behind that um, and, and, and understand that motivation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have two more thoughts that come to mind. One, uh, I'm always reminded you were talking about how many nukes you got. Um, <laughs> I'm reminded of yeah. Sting and his, I hope the Russians love their children too. Uh, kind of mm-hmm. classic music, right? So m- mutual love of children, I think, is something that that is hopefully something that we could uh, mm. we could use to energize us and uh, mm-hmm. that's that's an interesting thought and another one was yes. you were talking about when we're introducing change uh, let's embrace it in small bite-sized chunks mm-hmm. and, and incrementally and mm-hmm. what brought to mind for me was um, Niccolo Machiavelli he has a um, classic um, piece of political commentary called the prince and in that, he says something along the lines of, uh, I'm, I'm reading the quote here, it ought to be remembered that there is nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things. Because the innovator has for enemies all those who have done well under the old conditions and lukewarm defenders in those who may do well under the new. 
This coolness arises partly from fear of their opponents who have the laws on their side and partly from the incredulity of men who do not readily believe in new things until they have had a long experience of them. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> when you're trying to take on the establishment with capital T and capital E, <laughs> be mindful <laughs> not to get squashed. <laughs> yeah it happens it happens and learn from it if it does <laughs> yeah. see this is where we come from right because yeah. it seems to me like you're not really a proper agile coach until you've been fired <laughs> it's true it's true you're not you have to be fired at least once <laughs> all marginalized yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Gosh. all canceled yeah 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 yeah, That's yeah. Fun. very good Johan, right. this has been this has been a really interesting uh, chat, and um, thank you for bringing that passion about wickedness, wickedness in a good sense, wicked problems. Um, thank you for bringing that uh, to us, and um, it was really good to to also learn about the good work that you are doing in communities and cultivating through the mentoring program uh, of getting new coaches, fledgling coaches, actually getting fired for the first time and, and helping them through, through through that process to be able to, uh, you know, to, to build resilience in their practice as, as coaches. Mm -hmm. um, that sounds like really um, deep, uh, satisfying work uh, in order to, 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 to build and, uh, and strengthen the community that, uh, that, that we work in from time to time. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your time. I have one oh. last question for you before uh, we depart. What haven't we asked you that we should have? Uh, I think that it's uh, the question I'd ask is um, where to contact me and um, what's happening next with Wicked Agility. <laughs> um, and so uh, we are trying to figure out the community. So if anyone is here is on the call, um, you know, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm from Joanne Stone from Canada because there's a Joanne Stone from the U.S. who's, a, who's an amazing doctor. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> um, so I'm from like, the Toronto area. Um, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I also have a website, which is www.get-wicked.com. Um, and uh, we are doing a World Cafe on September 10th, and if it's on Eventbrite right now. So if you are, uh, if you connect with me on LinkedIn or in the contact me in the, my website, <coughs> um, you'll be able to to be part of that event and be able to create and figure out how we're going to make this happen. So um, I very much look forward to connecting with others around this, and it's uh, and I'm so thankful, Horia. It was just beautiful meeting with you in Agile 22, and I'm appreciative of meeting you, although too, it's great. Um, um, so <laughs> I thank you both for having me here today, and I'll be connecting with Aldo afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> set up a time where he can come online yeah, yeah, um so yeah. i really really do appreciate the time thank you awesome i'll grab those details uh from you uh after the recording and we'll add them to the podcast description so people can easily find the linkedin okay. kind of just click and get there click and get to them and right and and so on thank awesome you. thank you so much uh joanne uh i'm horia and i'm aldo thank you Thanks, everybody.